Welcome everyone. I'm Karen Liu, AIA, President of the American Institute of Architects, Minnesota, and Senior Associate at Snow Krylik Architects. I will be hosting and moderating, moderating this webinar today. Thank you for joining us for our Future of Design series and the session Rework, a safe return to research laboratories. Uh, this is the last of a series of sessions that AI Minnesota has organized focused on the future of design of the built environment with respect to COVID-19 concerns in the near term and questions to be explored for long-term planning. Previous sessions covered office space, arts and cultural spaces, higher education facilities, and healthcare facilities. These webinars have been recorded. You can find them on the AIA Minnesota website, aia-mn.org. Uh, before we introduce each of our speakers, I'd like to thank you all for understanding our need to reschedule the webinar due to George Floyd's memorial service this past Thursday. Um, so we are very grateful for the partnership of SCUP, the Society for College and University Planning. They invite you to visit them for more resources for higher education planners at www.scup.org. And a couple of housekeeping items. We are recording this session and we'll post it to our website soon after its conclusion. Also, we encourage you to type in your questions as you have them. AI Minnesota staff Ann Mayhew and Sherry Hansen will be keeping the technology going and helping with the Q&A section of the webinar. And with that, let's get started. The COVID-19 pandemic has created unprecedented challenges for laboratory environments. Labs were shut down in a matter of days to follow stay-at-home orders. As some states announce reopening plans, this will allow researchers whose work requires physical presence to advance research goals or grant requirements to reopen their labs. As we look forward to the reopening of labs post COVID-19, this webinar will provide some considerations that will guide the creation of a safe and healthy lab environment, as well as discussions on real challenges from university perspectives. These are the learning outcomes, and the seminar has been approved for one AIA Health Safety Welfare Learning Unit. So we've gathered an amazing group of speakers today to share their perspectives. Each of them has been working in their own sphere to identify and address near-term risks and to bring forward concerns and questions to keep in mind for the longer term. I think you can now see all the folks you'll be hearing from today and our sincere thanks for each, to each of you for making the time for this. Uh, you're going to see each of these folks again for the Q&A portion. For now, we're going to switch over to slides for the introduction. And joining us are Anna Pravanada, AIA, President-Elect of AI Minnesota and Principal at Alliance. Anna has, oh, sorry. Anna has dedicated much of her professional career to designing leader, leading edge research facilities for both corporate and academic institutions. In her leadership role on the AI Minnesota Board of Directors, Anna advocates for inclusive culture in the architectural profession. Mary Jo Spector, AIA, Director of Research Facilities, Design, Construction, and Maintenance at Florida State University. Mary Jo has worked at Florida State University for the past eight years. Previously, she worked as an urban planner and architect in Florida. She has also served as an adjunct instructor in the areas of urban design and architecture at Florida State University and Florida A&M University. Scott DeBlaze, AIA, Executive, Direct, Executive Director, Assistant Dean, Space Planning, Real Estate Management and Architectural Services at the University of Chicago Medical Center and Biological Sciences Division. Scott worked at the University of Illinois at Chicago and has been at the University of Chicago for the past 14 years, where he also applies his formal training as an architect. At the University of Chicago, he bridged deanships and the merger of the Biological Sciences Division, Pritzker School of Medicine, and University of Chicago Hospital. Anna Pravanada is going to kick us off. Anna, please share your screen now. As we get close to a lot of time, I'll give you a heads up. 
Go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so thank you, Karen. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in front of all of you. The COVID-19 pandemic has created unprecedented challenges for laboratory environments. Labs were shut down in a matter of days to comply with the stay-at-home order. Recently, labs have started to reopen. For example, University of Minnesota has Sunrise Plan, which is to assist in determining who qualified to work on site, required steps to get permission to work on site, and the requirements that must be met for employees working on site. As we look at reopening of labs, we at Alliance have developed several considerations that may guide the creation of safe and healthy lab environment. These considerations are meant as a starting point that may support organizations in the opening of their labs. At Alliance, we look at coming back to our workplace in six different categories, people, physical distance, space, access, reducing touch points, and communication plans. Some of these categories fall within what we call human behaviors, some are physical conditions, and the remaining fall into processes. For the purposes of reopening the lab, we will look at considerations in the physical conditions and processes categories. Physical distance, space, access, and reduced touch points. And most of these considerations focus on an open lab environment. The first one, under physical condition, is to disperse the lab workstation. In a typical lab module or aisle shown on the picture there, there could be up to four people. With 25% occupancy, you can spread the workstations enough to be more than six feet and to only have one person per aisle. The blue dots on the diagram to the left is showing occupied workstations. When you are up to 50% occupancy, two people will be in each aisle, and depending on how you arrange them, physical barriers such as clear acrylic may be necessary. The light green rectangles show a possible location for the acrylic where two people may be working face to face. Since this is a lab, the materials for the barriers will have to be easily cleanable and possibly heat and chemical resistant depending on the processes you will be doing in the workstation. Next item is to designate one-way traffic as much as possible. In an open lab configuration, you can have a clockwise or counterclockwise traffic going along the lab benches into one of the support rooms and go along the linear equipment room. Other physical changes that you can implement is to provide PPE at the entries to labs provide touch-free hand sanitizers, and provide disinfectant at multiple locations. Immediate low-cost measures is perhaps to install touch-free door handles. An example is shown on the picture. We need to be mindful of ADA or accessibility requirements and whether this type of door handle meets those requirements. In regards to processes, Lab managers can add a procedure for disinfecting work areas at the end of workday, as well as limiting access to shared lab facilities through online sign-up or secured access. Beyond those more immediate and simpler measures, indoor air quality is another factor in controlling virus spread. HVAC system adjustments may be able to mitigate the spread of the virus. Any changes will need to be vetted thoroughly as most research environments have equipment and processes that are sensitive to temperature, humidity, and particular levels requirements. First is to provide more fresh air by increasing the air change rate. This will impact the pressure level in a lab and should be carefully considered in conjunction with the pressure of the neighboring spaces. Second is to increase the humidity level. Some airborne viruses lose effectiveness above a certain humidity level. This modification may impact research processes and should be carefully considered. Third, 
install filter with a high MERV rating. The higher the MERV rating, the more particles will be removed from the air. This adjustment will require more powerful fans to overcome the air pressure drop. This will need to be carefully vetted by an engineer. The next one is to utilize UV lights inside of an air handling unit to destroy surface and airborne microorganisms within the air handling unit. This will help ensuring that the air leaving the unit is clean. The last one is to treat the air and surfaces within the lab space by installing bipolar ionization systems in the air handling unit. These systems introduce ions into the air that is delivered to the space. These ions have been shown to neutralize many types of bacteria and viruses both in the air and on surfaces within the space. Like UV light, there is nearly no optional pressure drop to overcome. So I want to emphasize that any of these HVAC changes will need to be vetted by an engineer due to the sensitivity of the research environment. So these are kind of like the initial list of strategies, which are meant to be a starting point for discussion. As the situation evolves, many more aspects of safely running labs will need to be addressed to allow employees to work in the lab environment safely and successfully. We will continue to monitor the discussions and recommendations and help lab staff as needed to reopen labs. So this is the end of my presentation, and thank you for allowing me to speak in front of all of you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the introduction. I appreciate this opportunity to talk about um, what is going on with research labs, how do, how do we make them safe, and what is this so-called new normal? I'm a project manager here at FSU. Um, I, wanna, I want you to take a minute to think back on um, what was the biggest, last big sporting event you went to? What was the last big art festival? you attended. Um, when did you ha last have a beer in a bar? Um, that was me on March 18th. It's kind of ironic. Um, and if any of you have traveled through airports recently, it's certainly a very surreal, surreal and unusual experience doing that. Empty airplanes, empty airports. So a little demographics background. I know most of you are in Minnesota. Doug is down in Illinois. And I am in um, Florida, Leon County specifically, I look every day at these demographics. And just as a starting point, um, Leon County has not seen the case rates and all of the, the terrible things that have come upon some of these larger municipalities such as Chicago and New York. Um, you know, personally, I don't know of anyone that has gotten the disease themselves um, and even secondhand information. It's, just unlikely. So it is a very different place. Um, it is largely a medium-sized town surrounded by a bunch of rural counties. You can see some of the demographic information. But we're up in the Panhandle, Florida, far from Miami, far from Atlanta, Orlando, and um, but we have quite a few students in this town. And that's part of what concerns me as we start to ramp back up. So the next couple of slides, I'm going to take you through um, the timeline of all of the things that we've been putting up with. And you're going to see this started slowly happening, um, you know, and just the messaging that was coming out from the university. And this was all in the ramp up or ramp down um, leading up to spring break, which was the middle of the spring semester. And so they had told students at that point, take everything home with you. Um, we're gonna teach at least the first two weeks online when you get back. And people went off on spring break. Um, at that point, they weren't going overseas, probably going um, to the beach. 
So spring week of spring break, these messages were just coming fast and furious. Um, you know, that week um, they decided they're going to put the rest of the semester online. Um, you know, who knows how many of the students even got that message before uh, the end of the week. Um, you know, at the same time, the local schools were all closed because our spring break coincides with the local spring break. So a lot of the staff and faculty from FSU had taken off and gone skiing or gone to the beach. And they were told when they come back to campus, there's a mandatory 14 day quarantine when they came back. Um, and then by the end of the week, the students were told, please don't come back to Tallahassee. We just don't want you here. Um, there was some just interesting and you know furious messaging that was going on. Excuse me. So at that point, research was still going online in spite of all these things that were going on. Um, however, it was looking as though we were going to have to ramp down and slow down. And so the research um, group asked all the PIs to identify their essential research and plan for ramping down if, if it was going to be suspended. And by April 1st, that's basically what happened down here. Um, so the ramp down occurred with respect to research. We were told hibernate and all, for, all but for a few approved exceptions. And so that's what happened then. And then by the end of the month, after four weeks of this, um, our governor allowed the start of phase one and we talked about the resumption of research. So this is how the semester ended. There was no in-person graduation. Finals were all online. And research was starting and the university was starting to open up and ramp back up again. Um, however, when that happened, they said the mandatory 25% occupancy. There were a lot of questions about that. Um, they recommended that didn't require PPE at that point, which I'll explain in a minute, and to get ready um, for the phase two ramp up. So on May 6th, research resumed, and that's when they said you had to have face coverings of masks at that point. So the summer semester started online. Um, FSU decided they would remain in this phase two, phase one, which was 25% occupancy through June 21st. Um, at the 27th, face coverings became mandatory throughout campus. And then, you know, one of our favorite seasons down here is hurricane season began. And it began um, quickly. It was the third name storm already um, this season. And that's what we usually have to worry about stoppages and electrical power about. We've had two closures over the last three years due to hurricanes. So what are some of the impacts to research at FSU? Um, this is a list of the activities that were allowed to continue as far as research was concerned. You can see, see it was extremely restricted. Um, and when it ramped back up again, there were a lot of questions about, you know, what does 25% mean? Does that mean if I had eight people, is it two? Can I overlap with anybody else, et cetera, et cetera? Um, a lot of those questions have been resolved. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what this has meant um, for various units around campus. Um, we probably only had 12 projects going during that four week shutdown. Um, we estimate that probably about a third of the PIs have come back at some level of research as of June 1st. And this is when I surveyed a series of groups. Um, you can see some of these other units, some have come up to a higher level and some have not. Um, psychology in particular, with a lot of animal work being done there, um, there was a concern about starting animal projects. The worry is because of their of durations anywhere from four weeks to several years, they were worried that they were going to go down into a shutdown again and they didn't want to start a long-term project without some assurance that it was going to be, um, they were going to be able to continue in the future. So here are some of the challenges that we have been faced with. Um, 
you know, limiting the people that want to work in the lab. There's a lot of labs that have wanted to go back and get everybody back in the lab and get the research program up and running, but they physically just can't do that because of these rules. Um, some of the work is really hard to do six feet apart um, when you've got these collaborative efforts going on, whether it's animal surgery or other things. Um, and then there was the issue of PPE. Um, back in March, there was a worry that the local hospital was going to have a peak number of cases. And so a lot of these researchers were asked to contribute any unopened PPE to that effort. Well, when they came back to the lab, they didn't have or had very limited amounts of PPE. Um, and you just couldn't get it. Nobody could get it at that point in time. And that was a problem. Um, Undergrads are still not allowed to be on campus, and some of these labs rely heavily on undergrads to do their research. Um, people are a little afraid to come back. There's no testing. Who can they trust? Um, and everything takes, seems to take longer. Uh, working remotely is great, but it still takes time to get approvals and getting physical materials here on campus. And as I said, um, these animal researchers are a little reluctant to start new projects. So here are some of the rules um, that we've got on campus now. And I think, you know, um, the, rules are the rules are extremely important, but I think the most important thing here is this testing and tracing. Um, we are in the process of putting a lab in place on campus that when it gets fully ramped up, will be capable of running 5,000 tests a week. Um, with the one day turnaround, which is also really important to people so that they will know right away if they're positive, if they're negative and get the all clear to basically come back. Um, however, I'm not sure that's gonna be enough if we've got 40,000 people coming back to campus, do the math. So where do we go from here? Um, you know, I think there are some good things. When you've got chemistry, animal facilities, um, you've already got 100% exhaust, no recirculating air in those particular areas and buildings. Those are relatively safe. Um, one of the things Anna talked about is, you know, we are replacing all of our Ill air filters in these buildings that have recirculating air with a MERV 13, which is a significant expense for us, but it's also an, an upgrade from what we had been doing. Um, I deal with contractors every day, and I worry worried about how to bring them onto campus from remote places without risking the safety of those already on campus. And so my next slide, I'm going to talk about something that's a little outside of the area of research. Um, But I think it's the kind of thing, and as architects, you know, we need to think outside the box on solutions. And it's what I'm calling the Thousand Chairs Project. Um, we live in Florida. If we want our students and staff to come back, we need to quickly implement projects that's going to be safer for them. And we got to think about this outside the box. Um, so even up here in Tallahassee, our average daytime high, sorry, Minnesota is 63 degrees. Um, that's not too bad. So why not bring in, let's put a thousand chairs outside. I don't want to encourage people to spend their breaks um, between classes inside the library um, or clo in closed up spaces. And so I'm suggesting that we get this project underway that'll encourage people to stay outside bring out their amenities to the table as far as that's concerned. Um, this is my closing slide. I don't know about you, um, but back in early March, I didn't know the difference between self-isolation and self-quarantine. I was sending out messages to my contractors and consultants and getting questions like, what's community spread? And having to explain it to them. Does everybody feel like they've learned a new language in the last couple of months? Um, has anybody else had to teach their 90-year-old mother how to Zoom? Um, and who thought that this is where we would be and what we'd be doing in the year 2020? Thanks. Thank you, Mary Jo. 
Our last speaker, Scott DeBlaze from the University of Chicago Me Medical Center and Biological Sciences Division is next. Scott, please share your screen. Hi everyone. Um, thanks first to uh, the AA in Minnesota and Scott for asking me to uh, present. Um, it is kind of crazy the times that we're living in and hopefully um, the information that I'll provide today will help you dig into a lot more detail of some of the physical layouts that you might be able to um, use in going back with your uh, research resumption plans. Um, the phases of reopening in Chicago are a little bit different by number. Um, we are in phase two and we're targeting a mid-June return. Um, we have already been through phase one where in essential lab workers um, could be on campus and working. Um, so we've kind of taken some steps already uh, to ensure that those people are safe and are, 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 are able to do uh, the work that's essential. Um, but we also need to keep in mind um, that since we're in phase two, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to phase three. Um, so uh, we already, um, we have plans for phase three in the works, but we also have plans for a rapid return to phase one, um, should it be required. Um, the goals of the presentation, um, what do we need to do to successfully return in phase two? Um, focus on areas outside of the campus that may impact us uh, while we come back to work, and what types of risk can people that are returning to campus expect um, and then what are the ways we can, different ways we can occupy private offices, shared offices, um, open offices with workstations, conference rooms, laboratories, et cetera. Um, and then what type of semi-permanent or permanent renovations are we considering um, to aid in the safe return of our workers back to campus? Um, so we always like to think about the good news and the bad news. Um, maybe the bad news is best to save the show first. Um, returning with a higher number of people, um, it's gonna take a lot of planning and a lot of effort on all of our parts. And it's going to take us um, talking to a whole bunch of people to make sure that we get it right. And how we accommodate for our lower lab density is important. But the good news is, is that we're talking about labs here. Um, and we're talking about people who are kind of worth, used to working with hazardous chemicals or materials. And so um, if there's anybody that could be prepared to do this, uh, a lab worker, hospital worker, uh, in the case of academic medical centers, are the people that are probably most prepared to do it. Um, so where are we kind of? Um, and this is where I'll start to get into some of the detail uh, and hopefully um, help people understand how we're approaching the, the solutions um, that we're providing to our, our, our investigators and staff. You know, um, will we provide works, uh, workstation areas on the floors with Purell stations? Um, and that was a question that came up very early on and what the answer was is yes, because the wet labs have areas in which you can wash your hands, but the dry labs or workstation areas do not. Um, how do we get signage installed and, and who might do it? And so we've taxed our building managers and some outside consultants to help work with us. Um, signage we'll get to a little bit further on in the presentation. Um, could doors and other areas that can be propped open be propped open? Um, we're handling this on a case-by-case -case basis, but yes, the answer is yes. We're, we're looking at ways in which um, we can limit the amount of touches on door handles and then hopefully um, make people more safe and secure by doing so. I just got off the phone with a person before this call, um, which we discussed having three rooms were opened in lab support areas uh, that would allow us to do this. Um, how will masks and lab coats be distributed to lab managers? I think Anna touched upon a little bit of this. Um, and then who will pay for them? Uh, so I don't have answers to all of those questions. Again, we're coming back in mid-June. Um, but in general, um, there are centralized locations in our buildings where people can come to pick those up in bulk and then distribute them through uh, the actual labs that they have on each one of the floors. Um, will training be needed for lab staff and other personnel? The University of Chicago will have um, online training that people who are returning to campus need to complete. 
um, how will the logistics of all this work? Um, uh, hopefully very well, but um, I think every single day uh, about slight hiccups and things that we can do better to make sure that the return is, is, is safe for all of our people. Um, you know, someone said, I think, you know, well, how will you know um, uh, since things change so often if you're following the right rules? I mean, these are just some of the places that I go to look uh, for input. And, uh, you know, one of the things that probably isn't on here is our faculty. Our faculty are, are, are great um, and inquisitive. Um, sometimes it's maddening, um, but um, they help us to get to a better place. And as always, you know, they're asking questions. Why can't I do this? Um, have you looked at this email from this faculty member at Harvard who's doing it better than you? Uh, why aren't you doing it that way? And so, um, you know, we're in an academic environment, and, and, and so you really can learn from the people within the environment um, the, about ways in which you can improve uh, how you come back to campus. Um, how can we be ready? Well, I think the first thing is just to make sure you define clear expectations. By this point, you know, it's been two months, and so I think most of us know um, you know, washing your hands more often than not is, is a good idea. Um, that face coverings are going to be required when you return to campus, and there are numerous different ways in which you can get them. And then how do we provide the university guidelines in such a way um, so that social distancing can be maintained with six foot um, bubble around, you know, about in a six foot radius of a bubble around you. Um, and, and everybody kind of understands that, I think. And so um, our 10% of essential workers were really pretty easy to deal with. Um, I'm sure that the 25% now um, that we have will add another layer of complexity, but at the same time, I think people have become more educated. Um, and so early in the, the, the presentation, I had talked about, you know, how do you start to look at the return to campus and the risks to our, our people's safety? Um, it's when we leave our homes. I mean, if you really think about it, once you leave your house and whether you get on a train or a car, a bike, an Uber, um, what are the steps that you need to take in order to make yourself safe in those locations? Um, it may take longer for us to get to, um, the work, get to work when we come back at 25% because we are waiting on a bus or a train because of the social distancing guidelines that um, they have in place. Um, and then how does that look like uh, when you're returning to campus? So if you're looking at the slide, um, I'm looking at the commute uh, area right there, but directly below it, I'm looking at a campus map. So then you might um, see this and, um, somewhere in campus, or you might want this prior to coming to campus, and it begins to look at the different entrances that are open and closed, and which one, one of those entrances has, uh, you know, attestation in terms of a proximity card swipe that says you do not have COVID-like symptoms. Um, it might have areas where you, if you go through, you're actually going to get your temperature taken, and it might have areas that are closed. So if we go to building entry, entry and we're kind of zigzagging up and down now, um, you know, what will you see when you enter into that? Well, you're going to see a sign below that says, you know, please attest that you do not have COVID-type symptoms, but if you do, um, follow the CDC guidelines by scanning your phone with this QR code or um, um, and, and if you do actually have those symptoms besides that um, please email a certain site where we can begin to look at contact tracing. Um, when you get inside of the building um, you're going to walk up to an elevator vestibule or a stairs. We're going to have signs posted about how much occupancy will exist within each one of those areas um, at your workplace, we'll have additional signage placed that will be put up by the actual individual administrators of those areas. Um, and that will talk about the physical distancing that is required in order for you to actually be seated in those areas. All of those plans um, in terms of the resumption of, and the use of space happen in advance to you actually returning to campus. Um, here's a sample of uh, the buildings that we send out that have specific people who approve the proximity cards uh, for each one of the returning uh, staff members. Uh, again, this is helpful because things tend to change a lot. And just had a call this morning about a person who said, hey, listen, you know, how do I get in such and such building? 
um, to pick up supplies. Um, and we said, hey, listen, we need to get in contact with this building manager and provide uh, appropriate approvals. That, that, that supply hub had changed from one building to another. Um, this is the um, active or uh, a test screening open or closed slide that I was talking about before. And again, it just shows the different locations within the buildings um, that are open, closed, and that what you will expect when you walk up to them. Um, and then you have the steps for planning uh, density. Um, so this kind of looks at the six foot radius and how it applies uh, to uh, specific workstations, enclosed rooms or shared amenities. Um, I should say that um, uh, when we looked to people to help us out with this, we've, we've got a lot of help from our consultants from Hera and also Perkins and Will. Um, they have been um, leading on a leading edge with some of this stuff and have been able to provide us with information that we've then in turn provided us to internal stakeholders. And I think it's worked out very well. Um, one of the slides here looks at um, a six foot radius circle. And um, it shows how, you know, for instance, the circle in actuality may, it may really look like. Um, and these are just illustrate, illustrating how they may look like. But if you go from left to right, it, is it just a radius or is it more of, a, of a, an egg that maybe has a part of the egg chopped off? Because if you sneeze when you're facing forward, um, we realize that you might actually push that bubble out further um, than what it is if it's just a pure six foot radius. Um, private office examples and shared private office examples are included here. Um, the green areas are where a person might occupy space. The red is where um, the spaces would be unavailable if you did occupy spaces in those areas. Um, and what you're seeing here is mostly that if you're in a private office, um, unless it's a very, very big private office, chances are it's probably just one person in there. If it's just one person in there and the doors are closed, um, at the University of Chicago, we are allowing people to take off their face coverings um, as long as they are the only one that's in the office and the door is closed. Uh, within shared environments, obviously, uh, face coverings need to stay on the entire time. Workstation examples, it's kind of uh, the same that Anna showed within the labs, except this is in workstations. And you'll see that's kind of like this uh, dot to dot, dot to dot. Uh, type of, uh, of rhythm with how you can occupy space. Um, so I think that's pretty self-explanatory, but it does show some different uh, layouts of workstations um, that, that you might experience within your space. Uh, meetings and conference rooms. Um, um, what we're saying right now is we're trying to avoid all meeting and use of meeting and conference rooms and face stuff. Uh, we're, we're saying that, it, listen, if you're doing that, you probably should be at home or you should probably be doing it uh, via Zoom. Um, but in the future, these are what these spaces might look like. So we wanted to give kind of an indication of, of how you might be able to use this. But also, if you plan on using some of these spaces as supplemental seating um, for, let's say, you had a floor of people that had um, a high density of dry space, well, you know, how do you make up for the fact that you only have 25% of, of your seating available for dry? Um, can you use some of the meeting rooms or conference rooms for that purpose? And the answer is yes. Um, floor workstations, kind of the same uh, as we've talked about with the workstation example before this, uh, just at a, a larger level, but again, you're showing kind of that dot to dot type of occupancy of space. Um, and here's one that actually begins to look at alternating day usage. The idea here is, is that it's still um, kind of a zigzag uh, occupancy plan, but that on the days that you are not there, or even on the shift or the time frames you're not there, you're always using your same space. And so that you're cleaning your space when you leave and, and, and you're cleaning your space when you come back just in case, but that it's only you that's sitting there. And so that's kind of a plan or a thought that is worth, uh, I think, thinking about prior to, to returning. Um, how does a research lab look like in terms of its density? Well, we're kind of being overly cautious on this. Um, and I actually spoke to this too regarding, you know, how many people can fit per aisle. And, and I'm echoing the exact same thoughts that she did. It's, it's pretty much one per bay right now. Um, and that comes up to a, a, either a, a one to three ratio or one to six ratio, something like that. 
uh, depending on whether you had two desks per half bench or one desk per half bench. Um, and then um, the second, those first two examples kind of portray that. The third example begins to look at what does it look like to walk around a little bit. So it's a person walking from their bench to a tissue culture room or in the blue um, diagram, the bench to a sink. And you can begin to start to see how the space gets kind of eaten up with um, areas where you could have cross traffic or air turbulence or things that you may not uh, expect to see if you're just doing this in plan. Um, office workstations and hoteling spaces. Um, again, private offices, uh, no private office meetings right now. We're trying to stay away from that. Um, you know, what are some alternates you can do in terms of putting up dividers or things that can increase the density? These are things you, we will be thinking about in terms of our next phase. Um, how do you handle hoteling spaces? Um, what we're saying is, is at this phase, there's no hoteling um, and that people that would need to hotel um, should be um, working from home, being on Zoom. Um, but in future phases, um, we're thinking about, you know, maybe putting um, cleaning and hand sanitizing stations in those locations and putting up um, some kind of uh, a guard or, or a plexiglass to allow for higher density, a number of people to be seated. Um, and what about higher panels uh, at workstations? Um, this has come up a lot actually recently where people are trying to push the envelope of the amount of people that they can actually have seated. Um, and, and right now we're telling them at this phase, um, you can't do it. Um, you see this big red box with a person through it. I don't mean to, um, to say that this is a terrible idea. Actually, it's a great idea. And it's an idea that one of our um, most productive researchers came up to us and said, hey, listen, why can't I just hang curtains down um, from the ceiling of the, of the labs? And that will create you know, a, a separation and that would be fine. Um, and we said, hey, listen, you, you're working with Bunsen burners and all types of other things, so we don't think it's a good idea. Um, again, that inquisitive nature of our faculty members, I think actually drives us to come up with different solutions. In that case, it wasn't a positive one, but still it, it taxed our memories and, and thoughts about how we come up with a solution to, to a problem of density. Um, that's that's the uh, presentation I have. Hopefully it, it's been helpful. If anyone has any um, uh, additional questions or needs from the presentation, I'm sure you can get it through. Um, through uh, SCEP or the AIA. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, so we're eager to hear our panelists' thoughts on the questions you've all posted. We've done our best to identify those that will be of broad interest or that went in particularly interesting directions. Um, thank you for compiling these, Sherry. And please go ahead and, and continue to enter in the Q&A box. Um, while we won't be able to answer everyone's questions, we'll do our best within the time that we have. And let's um, put everyone back on screen. There we go. So let's start with this. Um, there's a comment that says ASHRAE is now looking at revising guidance with a 100% out, outdoor air um, may not provide much benefit, nor ionization or UV lights, which sort of leads to the, the question, um, you know, since our understanding is changing rapidly, how are you prepared to respond? And Scott, you mentioned like getting basically emails from um, investigators and just how are you processing that and how, how, are, you, how are you responding to the deluge of information and changing information at that? Um, yeah, it, you know, it's been really difficult um, to try to figure out the right rhythm to handle the questions that come in. So it's, you know, the first thing is, is once the question comes in, identifying the right subject matter expert that can help with the answer. Um, and in a lot of cases, that's not me. Um, uh, and, and then fielding those questions to them and then trying to develop a way in which there's a feedback loop about an answer that is provided. Um, many times what you're doing is, is you're, you're handing these off to people in physical plan or other, other offices who are already overburdened with questions that come from different places. And so um, what I've learned is, is, is that, um, you know, handing them off to the right person is one thing, but also 
um, ensuring that you somehow develop a way, and it may be through um, Microsoft Teams or it might be through um, email, um, that you, you get back with these people in a, in a, in a, in a time period that is short enough um, that you can actually provide a valuable answer to the person who asked the question. Mary Jo, do you, would you like to address that as well? Well, we've gotten questions like we had one um, gentleman, I don't know if he was a researcher or not, ask if he could just cover up his um, air vent or get it turned off. And I said, I'm afraid we can't do that, you know, for a lot of reasons. And I, I think those, you know, if somebody's got a concern at that level, you've got to say, hey, maybe you shouldn't be coming back to campus. But that's not for me to say either. And, and you, from your timeline, obviously, as things change, you just have to address them as they happen. As um, they come up, yeah. yeah. And at the same time, you know, we've had so many people, I don't know about you, Scott, but we've got some very aggressive energy management people down here who, um, the minute they hear there's nobody in the building, just turn things way down low. And so I come into my office every Monday morning, and it's about 80 degrees and it takes all day for it to cool off. So, um, you know, I warned these people yesterday, I said, you're gonna get research people coming back up at 50% tomorrow. You better be taking care of this out there, so. Um, another thing that just to mention with that, um, you know, in a lot of cases working at an academic medical center can be very um, difficult because of, you know, you have three different kind of ways everything can go. Um, but in this case, our hospital actually had been dealing with a lot of these issues prior mm -hmm. to us having food. So there was kind of a roadmap in terms of them making the mistakes or, or, or the positive decisions and then us kind of building upon that. So um, we, we leveraged the work that they had completed uh, in some of these responses in a, in a better way than we could have without them. So our next question is, how does the use of PPP impact social distancing requirements? Anybody? From the University of Chicago's perspective, um, it's required. Um, so it doesn't impact social distancing at all. Um, uh, when you are in an open space, what, um, all of our build, the only exception to not wearing a mask inside of the University of Chicago within phase two of the return is if you have a closed office with one person in it, you're allowed to take your mask off. All other cases, um, you just have to have it on. We had an interesting challenge come up today. We've got one gentleman that, um, he's not totally deaf, but he lip reads in order to communicate. And so he needed to get some of the face masks that have this clear, opening um, at the mouth and I'd never heard of these and so it was a kind of an unusual request but it made perfect sense and unfortunately they're largely not available right now. Good point. Um, so maybe Mary Jo this you mentioned uh, animal research labs. Um, the question is COVID-19 is known to originate from animals via human transmission. Are there any special adjustments planned to animal research holding facilities? Well, I'm no expert, but um, I don't think they have determined what the animal reservoir is. They suspect it was bats. Um, at this time, and I don't know how it was for you, Scott, but largely a lot of the animals um, were, they call it culling, they were they eliminated a lot of the animals as a result of this ramp down and only a very limited number of animals were kept. Um, they have very rigorous controls that they have to abide by and regulations. And so um, I don't think there's anything being done. There's, there's really no need to do anything over and above what they're currently doing right now. Yeah, same at University of Chicago. Um, okay, next question is, and maybe Anna, you could take this one. How are instructional labs addressed differently from research labs? Hmm. So I've 
heard that you know from some of our clients that they have they will gonna they will have kind of like um scheduling so let's say they have 24 students in the lab they have 12 students coming on a days and then the other 12 students coming on b days so it's really allow the six foot um social distancing within um the instructional lab so you know so it's kind of it has to be like a combined blended online learning and on-site learning and they have to figure out you know how to give that um experience of like hands-on science experience and kind of like um divide their curriculum you know kind of like this could be done like fully online it's about lecture and then this needs to be done in the lab with like the you know like the hands-on activities for science experiments so building on that question is um is anyone researching other labs we mentioned the um instructional labs but social sciences psychology or even studios art architecture landscape architecture maybe a little outside of you know the research lab project type but um any information on those other types of spaces um, from fsu's standpoint no one has said exactly what we're going to do this fall semester they're still in a planning mode however um we are probably going to go to largely online except for what they call experiential classrooms such as chemistry labs such as psychology labs art studios music studios interior design studios uh, they feel are going to probably need to be done in person but um that may be the limit of the classes that take place in person on campus yeah from the university of chicago's perspective i don't know that we've made those decisions yet i think that's still something that they're trying to figure out i've had uh, numerous people come up to me and ask uh, you know hey listen um, how do i reserve this conference room that you know used to feed 60 people for you know 10 or 11 people for a class because um i want to i want to start to try to figure out how to seat my class for the upcoming semester mm -hmm. and at, at this point what we've said is is um we can't allow that to happen yet. We're still trying to figure out what it is or how it, how the approach, how we're going to approach this. Um, so right now, just, you know, hold on. Okay, let's move to the more practical. Um, here's a question about the screens and partitions being put up between um, stations. How are, are, are there concerns about cleaning screens and partitions between users? if they do need to share the same space or not? I would say they have to clean, you know, because they may sneeze onto the screen, right? So I would say that they have to clean every day after they work. Yeah, I would think that that was part of their workspace. And so um, when they clean the mouse, uh, the monitor, the desk, anything that they were watching would clean the, the front and back if there were uh, a screen that was put up, that would be you know, part of your responsibility to make sure that the space was safe, even though it might have been left the space after the prior to getting there. So I don't have any additional questions right now. Is there anything that you all wanted to add we're almost out of time right now well, Catherine has a, a question here about um you know it may take actually seven foot radius to the center of a person mm -hmm. and i thought that was a really good one i you know mm -hmm. i i have i'm not a professional inside of uh, autocad but it has i have taxed my experience and my memory from the studio back in the day um, I realize that she's absolutely right. Um, if you're drawing it from the midpoint center of that person you're putting, um, you do have to tack on an extra foot, if providing that you think that the uh, an average person is around two foot wide. Right. Well, very. I think that's about time. Um, oh, maybe any last comment? Mm -mm. No. no. Um, okay, as we close out, I want to first thank all of the speakers for joining us today.
Um, and thank you all attendees for carving out time from your calendars to be here. And um, a big thanks to our webinar partner, the Society for College and University Planning. I hope we can collaborate again in the near future. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Take care. Thanks.